there's always the educational task of providing enough structure so that people feel safe. Yeah. That doesn't mean that they have to feel comfortable. And, and one of the key tasks of a regenerative teacher or, or someone trying to, 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 to do some type of regenerative education is precisely there in creating a culture and creating um, a community that feels comfortable in engaging with uncomfortableness together. Welcome to the podcast The Embodiment Talks, a podcast by The Embodiment Lab with Mojon van Obijnen. Taking your role as change agent of societal or education systems requires vision and courage. This podcast will help you take this pioneer's role with more body awareness and confidence, without losing sight of the connection with others. We dive into how we as humans are hardwired, how systems change works, and how both are related. I will take you on my own quest, and I will share background information, talk to experts, and share exercises. We will think, feel, and act. Great that you're here, and happy listening. Today I'm here with Bas van den Berg, and Bas is Educational Coordinator of Mission Zero, Center of Expertise at the The Hague University of Applied Sciences. And this center conducts integrated research to come with regenerative solutions for sustainable futures. And we're definitely going to talk more about that because that's quite a difficult sentence, I think, to grasp um, immediately. And you also launched the um, Regenerative Education Podcast, um, where you talk with educators, researchers, activists, professors, and all of them work in higher education and they are engaged in regenerative forms of higher education, which also makes me very curious. (laughs) Um, So today I'm happy to be able to interview you. Sure. Thanks for taking the invitation because I thought you have such a nice overview on things that are happening in a regenerative education world. So I thought it was really nice to uh, to interview you to get a better view on that. Well, thank you. And um, yeah, and I, I, I'm especially interested in um, learning more from you about how the whole human being is integrated in yeah, the way of learning in regenerative education. Hmm. Yeah, that's so a big question. <laughs> it definitely is, but I hope that, um, yeah, let's just explore it. I it, it, it don't need to be um, definite answers or so, because I don't believe that they are there, but um, let's just explore how what you have found in your interviews and talks that you had with, uh, with people. Um, but to start, I think, it's good maybe to have a, an overview on um, what is regenerative education or what, how would you define that? Again, that's another very big question. <laughs> there isn't really a, a set in stone definition yet, or at least in a more like scientific sense, there's not really like agreed upon consensus that this is regenerative or that is not regenerative education we're with different people now trying to to identify well identify really what that could be and we have a working definition where, which sees it as a uh, as an ecological form of learning or ecological form of education that tries to uh, actively connect uh, university education with some of the grand challenges of our times for example, transitioning towards a new energy system, uh, or what Daniel Wall would, would call uh, redesigning the human presence on the earth. And while doing or engaging with those educational acts of trying to create change in the world, also seeing those as, as rich places to transform yourself, uh, to transform yourself in relationship with the world. Yeah. And that is what regenerative would yeah. be and what does that mean in education yeah so where we leave from is well i would just say climate science or sustainability science is that the way that 
our systems collectively are now designed is damaging um, to ourselves, but also the planet. And, and the latest IPCC report uh, made that really clear. Uh, we're transgressing the socio-ecological boundaries of uh, the places that we live in, the communities, uh, as well as the planet more generally, causing well, some really weird stuff. Uh, there's like a heat wave in India right now. Uh, many species are going extinct, all those types of things. A lot of people dealing with eco-anxiety, eco-grief, or general stress because of climate change. What regenerative sustainability, uh, which is a perspective of, essentially a perspective of what we should do as humanity in relationship with those different systems, it argues that we should try not to just minimize our negative impacts as a species, but to try to maximize our positive impacts, to try and be, well, you could say, as a gardener or as a steward in relationship with uh, the planet, with other forms of life. And regenerative education essentially tr acts or tries to act as a bridge between universities and the time that people spend in universities with that work, with that systemic change work, uh, and with that systemic change in a way that it also includes the personal, because if systems change, if the ways we live change, we also have to change, or sometimes because we change, systems change. There's a dialogue there that goes both ways. And eventually, the the sort of goal, which is way beyond what any single educator or university can do, is to play an active part in well, transforming, uh, transitioning the way that all of us are um, from energy systems to the way we look at work and, and then anything in between. Yeah. And if you say that, is that um, mainly about what we learn? Because if you talk about the energy transition or mm -hmm. climate change and how to how to design systems, um, it, it's all about okay, what's out there in the world, and how could we possibly deal with that in another way so that mm -hmm. it it is sustainable or yeah. regenerative. Yeah, I mean. So the, the what you're learning for um, is, is an important part of the transition towards regenerative education. But it's not the only part, and just learning about uh, or working on change externally is never going to, um, well, A, it's never going to work, because if you only look outside yourself and you don't include what that means for you, uh, whether in external expressions, like the behaviors you have to change, but also in the values, the worldviews, uh, the way you look at the world. Those two go hand in hand. You cannot really have systemic change without personal transformations, um, although not all of them will be as deep and as rich for each individual involved in those systems. And you can also not really change yourself without having an impact on systems that you're nested in. So only working externally isn't really enough because you're also always working internally. And I mean, there's different different models and perspectives that you can take with that, like an external dimension and an internal one, or a I, it, they, we uh, dimension. Mm -hmm. um, I personally prefer the framework by Bista, the philosopher with you know, focus on qualification, subjectification, and um, socialization um, but yeah so you always need to learn you need education consists of learning for a what but also for a why and a how and if any one of those is missing then it's not really education it's just learning there's nothing necessarily wrong with that um, but I think that there is a lot of wealth um, or different forms of value that you can get by embracing a more educational stance instead of only a learning stance. I like that difference that you make between education and learning, mm -hmm. and where you actually say like the broader perspective on on who we are as human beings and, and how we can learn is what we learn in education. But I think that the, our, the majority of our education system is based on learning. Mm. 
yeah. it's kind of filtered out that whole who am I as a person? What do I find important in education? Yeah. So we, um, and I, I, I found that in the interviews that you do as well, mm -hmm. as many people search for different ways of, of educating, um, uh, educating students. Then I wonder whether we even can say like whether you, you educate students because <laughs> you kind of take them on a journey to discover. And yeah. in that journey, part of that is kind of the learning of certain parts and the other parts is mainly like a discovery of who we are, what we find important or mm -hmm. um, how do you view that? It's a... Uh I mean, for a variety of reasons, it's a really interesting question, but I, I think you're correct in stating that it's more kind or more akin to guiding. Um, but even there, I think guiding doesn't entirely cover it. I'm not sure if there is a word in, at least in English, or maybe in any language really, that really cover that really captures it uh, in its entirety. Because on the one hand, it is more like guiding where you're creating the structures, the processes, the systems, the pedagogical choices that that, um, well, that help people engage with some of these grand challenges that help them also engage with who they are becoming as they are doing so, right? That sort of double uh, external, internal forms of learning coming together. But at the same time, it also asks a certain degree of being able to be guided as the process unfolds, as the people involved with those forms of regenerative education become more uh, able to also navigate themselves and not holding too tightly on your own role as a guide in that sense. Um, so it's, it's, it's a guiding form, but only to the extent where it has to, where you have to guide uh, and you eventually hope that they take over the guiding or it becomes more of a co-participatory process with them. I also quite like inviting, in a way, mm -hmm. inviting people to uh, look at some of the grand challenges, inviting people to look inside themselves, um, but inviting them still from the perspective that you are an educator, um, you are trying to, well, I would say, create change uh, within them, but also within the world uh, as our educational task. Uh, and not just saying, well, there's a problem, good luck. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and is it is it really that you as an educator want to create change inside of them? I often say to my students as well, it's not so much what you do, but as long as it's a deliberate choice. So I think you need to mm. have all the information that's available um, now because mm -hmm. of course that that's different from tomorrow and from yesterday yep. um but within that context you can take choices you can make choices and if that means that you want to just pollute the entire planet be my guest as long as it's a deliberate choice to that is what i want to do mm. i want to benefit myself no matter what um yeah. Or I can take another stand and say, OK, now I have the knowledge that I didn't have before and therefore I think I want to do something else. Yeah, I, I always find this sort of question or this, this line of questioning very interesting. And I think in part it's because of the, the cultures that we are brought up in that, that really places a high value on uh, individual choice and freedom. But to a large extent, I would agree with you. Um, but I also think that there are hard ethical and moral limits that I wouldn't myself be comfortable allowing uh, or nurturing or maintaining within an educational setting that I am connected with. And one of those would be um, when someone has been presented with you know, the latest climate science to purposely make that choice to say, I'm going to just pollute as much as possible. I would really see that as a, an ethical line that just, that's just not acceptable, really, um, towards ourselves also because it's self-damaging, but also towards uh, non-human life, 
or more than human life towards each other, uh, towards the, war, the world's poor, and etc. And I don't really believe in in that sort of that sort of radical, almost valuelessness that people sometimes want teachers to take. Uh, it doesn't really sit well with me. Um, and there's other examples in the social justice realm, for example, where mm -hmm. the same argument <coughs> holds up. Yeah. No, I can definitely agree with you that it wouldn't be a system where I would like to relate myself to. Mm. Um, definitely. <laughs> <My> <laughs> everything <laughs> I did so far is about sustainability and systems change and um, uh, personal change. Yeah. And at the same time, there's something in it that I can't, I can't convince or I can't um, yeah, I can't convince the other mm. um, to behave in a different way. Um, no, okay. And and I'd hope that the things that I provide would lead them to uh, a more sustainable way and having a deeper understanding of the underlying systems that create that created the current world. Yeah, yeah, that keep creating the current world. Yeah. No, I mean. Of course, you cannot. Well, you cannot reasonably force other people to change their behavior, um, but we can do our best to invite the the values and the perspectives of the things that we find important, uh, informed by science, I would say. But at least, um, for example, sustainability and social justice would be values that I would say are important. Mm -hmm. Uh, to do our best to invite those within our educational designs, to invite them within our context, to not shy away from the challenges that those that in, that inviting brings with uh, with them, the uncomfortable conversations, uh, especially about social justice issues, um, and especially in a city like The Hague, which is very international and multicultural and, and all those types of things. Um, actually we see probably as much of the social side of sustainability challenges here as, for example, in Wageningen, they would see the ecological side because it's just a completely different cultural context. Uh, but yeah, so trying to educate in a regenerative way, I would say, doesn't alleviate that educational responsibility as well as the moral responsibility of bringing those difficulties of both inviting people to see them, uh, to engage with them, to work with them, including yourself, because sometimes you also fuck up. Um, but then also having the courage uh, and the vulnerability to be able to keep bringing them back into educational spaces precisely because they can be extremely uncomfortable. Uh, that That's a challenge, uh, but just because something is challenging doesn't exclude us from responsibility. So, yeah. It's important. <laughs> mm. What do you see as one of the big challenges that you face in your educational programs? I mean, there's so many. Uh, looking from the perspective of trying to bring, you know, these sort of more regenerative forms of education into being that really connect with local challenges and then also include that sort of sub uh, subjectification or, uh, or personal uh, relationshiping with the world. The, the biggest ones are, well, I would say that there, it depends on which system level you take, but for example, the culture in which people are educated. Um, so they come into my courses, they're probably like 21, 22, have been engaged with an educational system. Roughly all of them have been engaged with an educational system that's quite Western, uh, very specialized. And that's something where you make you may say indoctrinated into an educational system that they would have to break out of and it doesn't happen just by providing space and invitation it takes ongoing commitment and effort um, the on a more systemic level the amount of time and resources required to work in such a way are much larger than the so-called more efficient forms of teaching cognitive skills you mean like teaching in another other way requires more time? A different time, yeah. 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 So it requires more time as it unfolds um, mm -hmm. because it's more flexible, more emergent. Um, it's more about slow engagement with really complex issues. And 
it's not that there's not enough money in the system to do that. It's just that the way that we are organized now doesn't really allow for that type of money to be spent where I believe it should be spent. And then there's also a major uh, barrier or resistance within educational actors themselves, so teachers, uh, administrators, policymakers, who um, a lot of them don't really see, uh, or they, or they, it's it's really interesting. They see it that it's necessary, but they don't feel yet that it is necessary now, or they're too scared to engage with it, or both. But yeah, so there's there's different barriers at different system levels. Um, some of them are much easier to deal with than others. Yeah, yeah well, it's interesting what you say with other educators. I don't <laughs> exclude myself from that, by the no, way. No, no, <laughs> but I, I, I recognize that as well. But so it's, it's uh, there's two things I think that's in that, what you just said is on one hand, um, it's a nice example of like as within, so without. Hmm. So that we have to do that interchange at all levels. Yeah. Um, ourselves to be able to educate in a different way. And the other thing I think is the stepping in the not knowing and, and trusting that an education program will, will emerge as you go. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, and that in that, uh, because just, just before you, 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 we spoke about like that it takes a little bit more time um, and indeed, you already corrected me, like, is it more time or is it different time? Yeah. Because just those just the structure of twice 45 minutes classes mm. and then a break and then um, doesn't work. But for example, a whole afternoon where you really have time to kind of dive in material could mm -hmm. work very well. Yeah. Or um, full days or something like that. So it's also kind of rethinking um, the practical structures as oh, yeah. much as, as re yeah reflecting on ourselves and what we face in Absolutely. educating in a different way. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, uh, well, I'm in different time, mostly from a systemic, it's like total amount of time and money we spend on higher education specifically. Like if we stopped with all of the bullshit uh, that just doesn't really add much educational value tomorrow, it's not like there's not enough time. It's deliberate choices that we misspend public funds. Mm -hmm. Although people don't see it as such, so, yeah. That's a very economic view on education. It's an economic so view. The balance. It's an economic view on educational management, not so much on education. I would say. Mm. Um, yeah. But yeah. It, in the end, you know, we can. And w with Mission Zero, we also try to move towards different economic systems. And it's always difficult, especially if you're stuck, if you're partially working in a system, but you're also working on a system, like when you're trying to educate in a different way, you always need to find a balance between how hard can I push um, specific actors and specific niches within the system without losing uh, and losing support because if that happens, mm. then you're, you are you may have a really good idea, but you're not going to create systemic change. So then what's the value? Right? Then you just have a concept. It's like, okay, cool. Right? Doesn't really make a difference. And a big challenge of that also, I, I at least, a difficulty with that that I really see is one of strategic communication. Where if I'm speaking with a manager or like a program director, I'm going to use different arguments and different perspectives than if I'm speaking with a teacher. When I'm taking a systemic lens looking at an institution like to us or any other large university, it's not the case that there are insufficient resources to transform our educational system. It's more the case that we are incapable, and we in the broader sense are incapable of perceiving the choices that we make that that are foundational to the system as both places that we can intervene but also as places that are limiting and that's much more uh, sort of collective cognitive dissonance challenge than a financial one yeah and it probably is also because we don't feel the consequences immediately no so huge delay in systems 
most um, systems, and, yeah. 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 And then it's difficult to relate to the decisions that we actually have to make, um, not knowing the exact outcome. Yeah. But it will bring us emotion. And from the motion, we can, you know, adjust as well. Absolutely. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. I think we're always in motion, but just the big question is which direction we're going in. I, yes, and and within the systems, we've um, made many structures fixed as well. Yeah. And they're difficult to change. And the bigger it be gets, the more difficult it, it's to change as well. Yeah, it's it's I'm I'm always unsure about that, which may sound weird, but I I can see where people where when people say that I can see where they're coming from. Like if you look at a large organization as a system at a sort of trend level, it doesn't look like it's doing that much. But if you zoom in you know, almost to the on the nano level, like individual teachers or students or even programs like change is ongoing right movement is ongoing so it's always this all those it's, it's this weird dichotomy there between almost like an inertia but also a, f a lot of movement so um it always makes me feel a bit weirded out i guess about systems theories and then studies in that sense when we talk about the sort of resilience of, si of systems where we always ma we almost make it seem like they're a static thing when they're they're not really i mean it may seem and feel like that you know i get frustrated all the time when i feel like the university isn't transforming fast enough but the transformations never stop they may not always be in the direction i want them to go in or the speed at which i want them to go with but it's not like you know one day to the other and they're, they're not the same days right even the same lecture series or workshops, the you know, from one week to the next, it's a completely different setting. We just it's very easy to forget that uh yeah, it's just very easy to forget that uh, when it doesn't seem like transformative change has happened, that any change has happened. No, I can agree with you that it's always on the move and um that no day is the same as the previous or the next and yet I also have experienced um, how difficult it sometimes is to already go from two hour um, lectures classes to half day oh, or yeah. even a full day um, even if it's just for that one course mm -hmm. um, because then there's panic accreditation <laughs> and you know so um, and that's probably what I mean with like we've, we've also within that, that oh, right. motion there's always structures that are very fixed and mm -hmm. there's a lot of panic if we're gonna yeah. do it different at least oh, what no, i absolutely. experienced not yeah. at all places so and it, it really depends but um no i completely agreed and and then and it really touches on two main um, resistances or barriers that, that we also identified that are quite difficult to navigate and one of them being that that there are a lot of those structures that are perceived to be as fixed when really I mean they're not the laws of thermodynamics right it's just a perception that they are fixed and sometimes I even run into that like uh, a few weeks ago I was finishing up a management report which I, I don't like doing I have no issue in in admitting that but there was one KPI that we had to report which to be honest the KPI is just bad like whoever came up with it, I'm sure they had the best intentions, but it's just a poorly designed KPI. So I said, I got a, uh, an email. It's like, do you want to report it? Here's the data. I said, no, thank you. They're like, what do you mean? No, thank you. It's part of the management report. I said, well, oh, sure, but it doesn't mean anything. Like literally, it doesn't say anything. So if you can explain to me, argue why I should report this, what's the reasoning behind it, um, then I will do it. Oh, they said, well, because we all agreed this year we would report this KPI. I said, that's not a good enough reason. I'm not going to do something because the system expects me to do it just because of that. Like, there needs to be some type of argumentation. Um, so I didn't, right? But that's easier. That's a, that's a similar type of resistance, but it's easier to navigate because if I'm asking, if I'm only a teacher and I'm asking, 
uh, to go from 45 minutes to a half day, I may not feel like I have that type of control because then you're asking to expand something instead of asking to reduce something. Um, but that sort of perceived limitation of what are the places that we can intervene within the educational system, that's a massive one. And I think underneath that is um, mostly psychological, really is just fear, um, fear of the unknown, like you said. I think fear of uncertainty, maybe also just fear of trust, you know, trusting that all of us are going to do our best. Um, that we're professionals to some extent, at least, and yeah, yeah. And to add a, that is as well the um, how much are we allowed to fail? Mm. Like if you if you experiment with new structures, that's not going to work immediately in the way how you want it to work. Or ever, yeah. um, or ever, because then but then you have tried it and yeah. you think okay. And there's the Good assumption attempt, there that but didn't what, work. yeah, and you have the assu- the assumption there that uh, where we left from is already working, which is not always the case either. Like it's very you, often not the case. It's almost never Otherwise the case. Otherwise, we don't really. need to change this. <laughs> well, I think yeah. it's also just human to change <laughs> yeah, in general. Yeah, but true. <laughs> no, but yeah. like the lecture series you were describing, we know that lectures don't really do much. Yeah. Like unless you are a world quality like that level type speaker. And even then, people are going to forget like 99% of it. But we just keep clinging on to it and anything else then, you know, has to compete with that when in reality, the basis that you're comparison with is sort of kind of shit. So, yeah, it's a it's mm. a really weird sort of... It, it's weird for people to be stuck in that and knowing both of those realities and then still feeling like they don't have enough space to maneuver. Sometimes really just not feeling instead of not having or not being able to take, and other times actually also being stopped to taking it, which I think is even more tragic. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, interesting. (laughs) What brought you personally on this journey of regenerative education? What were Uh, those pivotal points in your life that mm. I want to do it different? Well, I've always um, I've always cared about uh, nature and sustainability, and uh, to be honest, social justice, the social side of sustainability came much later for me. Um, I just, yeah, I don't know, was just always more about non-human life than human life, I guess. Um, but. There were, I think, two things that really played a big part. One of them is that I'm originally trained as an engineer. I did some projects, you know, reducing CO2 equivalent in different industries. And I very quickly realized that technology by itself is not going to fix it because we're talking about, I think, fundamental change in in who we are um, in relationship with the planet. And technology can have a very transformative role in that. I don't think anyone can really deny, can realistically deny that, but technology can also help uh, further destroy those relationships. So it's really about more conscious technologies. That was the the first sort of main realization or epiphany. And then later on, it was a disease. I um I got a disease called ankylosing spondylitis a few years ago, which is a very fancy Latin word, um, but uh, it's a form of uh, arthritis uh, of the spine, uh, neck, shoulders, spine mostly, hips a little bit, that um, basically gradually gets worse, um, more pain and those types of things. And that really w- acted also as and continues to act both as motivation and also as a impetus to really carefully consider what I find important. And what I find important is, you know, helping, being of service to um, mostly more than human life. And so I tried to find different places where. I think that interventions can have um, exponential impact. And I think that 
generally speaking, that's in infrastructure systems, or at least I call them infrastructure systems, but sort of the basis, uh, the basic systems that run society. Um, and for me, education is one of those systems. Uh, it could also have been healthcare or energy or food, um, but I had most affinity with education. And other than that, I never really cared that much what other people thought about me, which helps if you're trying to do something different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not having so much shame uh, makes it easier to just say, well, let's see what happens. <laughs> and I think that's what we just spoke about, about the structures and the fear to to step into the not knowing that's very helpful if you mm. uh, yeah. just dare to step yeah but i think yeah. it's also a personality trait to mm -hmm. some extent i mean i'm sure it's also something you can train mm. um but yeah i also think it's something that some people just naturally are more predisposition to i mean if people that would jump out of an airplane and people who wouldn't type situation although i don't feel like i'm jumping out of an airplane and to to make that more concrete, eh? so if I would join one of your classes, mm -hmm. um, what would I experience to be dif different from how how I was educated, which was in the previous century? So it must, <laughs> a lot must have changed anyway. But um, uh, um, no, just like like what <laughs> do you do different from more the mainstream lectures or courses or and in it? and then to make it concrete? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if it's particularly different, but uh, I'll just guide you through one of the courses and I'll let mm -hmm. you decide whether or not it's different. Um, so our courses always start with community building. Um, I mean, of course, we, we send some information in advance about like syllabi, whatever. Mm, not really because we stick to it. Um, we don't, but mostly just because it makes people feel safer. They have a feeling that they know what they're going to do. So very often the first few days are excursions to natural places or excursions to the physical places that we're working with. Um, for example, quite close to here, you have the West Westland area where they grow the most, uh, most of the food um, agro-foods of the country. So we work with them a lot. So we go to different places there, talk with people, see the technologies, the systems, try and map out, you know, what are we observing? Um, and then also observing in the fullest uh, multi-sensorial sense, uh, helping people, especially students, engage with that. Also using technology. So there's nothing wrong with using technology as instruments, just as long as they don't become devices that control you, basically. And what do you mean by multi-sensorial yeah, so education? Well, so we don't really do um, education in the multi like for multi-sensory development. I know that's a field um, in its own right, but what I mean is we, we challenge students particularly to, to look. So what do you see? What do you see behind? what you're seeing, what's the system behind it, what do you smell, what do you hear, what do you touch, um, maybe what do you taste, if it's safe to taste. Um, and those different things also tell, um, are just different forms of data that they're not really used to, especially the engineering students that we work with a lot. Um, and actually just explaining to them that their own experiences and, and reflections and observations can also be a valid form of data is already quite transformative for some of them, um, which I always find surprising and a little bit disappointing in the broader system. Uh, but in that sense, multi-sensorial, so asking and inviting and also helping them to use their bodies enhanced by technology at times to, um, to, to observe. Uh, in the whatever form works for them. Some of them have very good noses, for example, others don't smell anything. Um, so yeah, so the entire first sort of week is basically just that. Um, I usually take students axe throwing as well in the first week, which mostly just to get to know each other on a more personal level. We really found it in the data, but also our own teaching um, in the first week, you set the culture in the community. 
and it's like full time projects that they work on. Yeah. You talk about the first week, and yeah. then how long do they those projects? Usually have? either ten or twenty weeks full time. Okay. Yeah. And then within those courses, so they work on a, r a project. It seems like with yeah, communities so here somewhere around the Hague. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then part of that is like. Do they work on those projects in groups, or how does that? Yeah, yeah. So um, basically, after the first, uh, so the first week is just getting to know each other, getting to know the the challenges or the starting points, really, because we always try to say these are the starting points that we identified. They are not necessarily the angles or the perspectives that you want to work with. That's part of the the first few weeks as well. So then the first after that, you know, we make smaller teams just for manageability, really. Um, you know, working with 30 people in a team is just really difficult, um, especially for students. But to be honest, I think for everyone, I think there's some like psychological research that, that says like any group bigger than eight doesn't really work well together or something like that. Anyway, um, so yeah, so about 80% of the time, roughly speaking, they work with the team on the project. So in the external world, um, we try to be with them as much as possible, also in those external places, um, partially as a way to make sure they actually go, which that's that's one of the limits of the digital age now, that it's not as easy as it used to be. Um, but also because we don't necessarily see our role with these challenges as teachers in the traditional sense, but more both as that guide, but also as a co-researcher in a way where we are also just interested in some of these challenges more content-wise, and um, that's one of the characteristics of these challenges. No one really knows how to solve them, so we have to do it together. And then, um, so, and then usually speaking, two or three times a week, there's some type of coaching, um, coaching or reflection sessions hosted. So that can either be, you know, using some modern project management aspects like Agile or something mm -hmm. like that, daily stand-ups to having uh, arts-based reflections, workshops, or, or hikes, for example, to really just calm down, slow down. And about 20% of the time, students are working individually on uh, sort of the inner parts of uh, sustainability. And for that, we, we tend to create um, very specific learning journals, uh, diaries in a way, uh, specific to each course that students then mm -hmm. also work through and that also become part of the formal assessment. And basically that structure, we just hold on to that for as long as we have them um, or as for as long as they're in our temporary care. And every four or five weeks or so, we will host uh, an update, um, sort of like a formative assessment update moment uh, with the broader community, so also the people that they are engaged with in the places that we're working with. And they're not really to grade, um, because we don't really grade, to be honest. Um, mm. We judge in the end together. So do you feel like you've spent the amount of effort that warrants this many ECTS? Mm -hmm. um, do I feel like you've spent the amount of time Usually the answer is both yes, then they just get a pass. Um, and w we have also experimented with different ways of, of incorporating, for example, also like personal storytelling uh, or different, there's just different ways to do the update basically. But that sort of structure doesn't really change because we just found that it, it's adaptive enough while also providing enough psychological safety to step into the unknown together. Yeah. And that is like one course that they do or is every semester organized in that way? Well, the semesters I teach on directly are organized in that way. The structure doesn't really mm -hmm. change. The, um, the Depending on, you know, the year or, or the size of the course that may change, but the sort of the ground rules, um, you know, the 80-20 split between external and internal work, the frequent coaching, but not long coaching and not really having that formal assessment but really focusing on how is it unfolding does it make sense in relationship to what we're going through together that doesn't really change those are those are quite core uh principles um we're not 
yet at the point where all education or universities are organized in blocks of 30 ECTS. Um, I wish it was, because it would definitely make things a lot easier. Um, but you can still bring in some of those practices, even in a much smaller course. Like if I've taught two or three ECTS courses where I still found it important enough to just spend the entire first uh, class going on an excursion, just to make sure that they also knew each other. Um, and you can always, you know, content, especially these days, providing content isn't that difficult. And frankly, it's a bit of a waste of time to focus on that. And in those projects, if you say like it's a waste of time to focus on the content um, to, and to provide that, actually, there's a lot available that they can find themselves within those courses. Are they um, do they kind of organize their own the content that they want to learn themselves? So can they invite guest teachers or can they yeah. say like, OK, we want to have a class on this topic yeah. or something like that? Yeah. So that does happen and they're invited to do so both of those things and usually speaking it's always a combination of we will prepare a few workshops in advance especially on stuff like research methodology and research skills that they're just going to need right or for example basics of sustainability science those types of things but as that goes on and as they mature also in their process their own active role in co-creating the content um, and sometimes that can really be as simple as them saying okay we want to have a class about this it's okay we'll get a class about that um, and other times it's really okay we need this or this guest expert and oh, well, let's ask them see what happens uh, but even within that the way that we teach is slightly different perhaps than um, than what people are thinking about when they think about classes. So when we deal, for example, with a book, um, in, in the course I was describing, our students read two full books, about uh, 600 pages or so. And it's not really that much of a problem. The first few weeks they're like, oh, I don't like reading, but, you know, tough luck. That's just yeah. part of education. But we asked them, for example, to read two chapters to prepare for something then I'm not going to come in and just repeat those two chapters or or, or move, discuss the third chapter or something like that. I'm going to directly ask them, okay, what are questions that you've, that, mm. that were raised with you by reading that? What was unclear? Or what do you learn to discuss more? And that forms the basis then for designing that content in the moment. So we don't come with, or we very rarely come with slides or anything like that. You know, if we tell them to read, you know, Introduction to Creative Research, we will also read Introduction to Creative Research. Even mm -hmm. if it's three years later, I will read it again and again mm -hmm. and again. Because I want to be present and I want to be able to engage with them in understanding our collective, or in increasing our collective understanding based on what's needed at that moment and not based on what I Recall predicted. <laughs> three years ago. Yeah, yeah, or what I predicted they would yeah. need. Um, so yeah. we do have teaching hours, but it's more engaging in, in collective dialogue or highlighting our collective um, gaps in our knowledge and using that then, for example, say, okay, well, next week, um, you and you prepare something about you know, this gap I'll prepare something about that gap. Let's see where we end up. Mm. You don't always have the time to be able to say, well, let's do it tomorrow. Um, it would be nice if you always did, but yeah. Mm. Yeah, so what I like in what you say is that on um, one hand, what I hear, I put it in my own words, but you are as much a student as they are, and you are as much a teacher, maybe, as they are as well, in yeah. different ways. Um, trying to be. Trying to be, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's also still, and this is one of those places where there's a huge tension between um, ideology 
you know, of that sort of regenerative sustainability and really trying to do, to, to be equals in that type of learning process. And also uh, experiential and uh, educational reality where sometimes you do have to be able to say, okay, this isn't going in mm -hmm. a uh, direction that's conducive for the type of learning that we're trying to do. And then to step back into that sort of more authoritarian role when it's needed um, and also being honest about that, uh, open about that, which isn't always as easy and especially not as, um, it's especially not easy if you are trying to be in that more open role and then having to step back into that more strict role and then letting that go again to go back and uh, it creates mm -hmm. a, you, there's still the power dynamic that's fundamental yeah. that's that doesn't go away um and you're still giving them that pass as well so in the end there is a dynamic that yeah that is never fully equal no and sense. and i can ask them to give us a grade too mm -hmm. uh, we do sometimes but it's not formalized with the same amount of power if they give me a non-passing grade as a teacher it doesn't really impact my life no if I give them a non-passing grade, they have to redo an entire semester. So you can never get rid of, or you could even question if you want to get rid of that difference, because it's also one of the ingredients that allows some of the less fun but important parts of education to be educational. For example, you have to read this book, but I don't like reading, so it doesn't matter. It's part of your development. Yeah, and even if you talk at a more, if you, you look at more like how communities work, even there, you know, you, you, you talk to each other like, hey, are you contributing that much to yeah. the community as you want yourself or that serves the community? Hmm. Um, uh, so if you work with them for half a year, um, there's many opportunities to kind of already have that conversation. So... Um, so I think there's a real power dynamic. Uh, there, there is, obviously, mm -hmm. um, but you kind of use it if you would say in the end, like, okay, now you get a feel and I never talked to you before. Yeah. Um, but you, if you try to coach students and um, uh, yeah, you take them along on their own journey and you guide them and then, yeah, at one point you may have to set a boundary. Yeah, absolutely. Or well, you're continuously setting boundaries. You're just not doing it maybe as overtly or as harshly mm. as in more traditional forms of learning where you say, this is what you have to learn, this is the test. Like That's, that's not the case. But completely having no boundaries, um, even going as far as to say, well, we're first going to co-identify a challenge, for example, that may work for a very small subset of people, um, but for the majority of students, I think the majority of humans really that is so open to the degree that it becomes uneducational so there's always this this tension as an educator especially if you're trying to, to do this sort of walk the line between um, participating in, in active regeneration of systems and being part of an existing system that asks certain choices mm -hmm. that you that you find an ongoing and, and keep renegotiating what that balance is. Um, but there's always the educational task of providing enough structure so that people feel safe. Yeah. That doesn't mean that they have to feel comfortable. And I think that's a really important distinction. So there's, not a, there's not an educational problem in feeling uncomfortable. There's an educational problem in feeling unsafe. Yeah, but yeah, you've if it's real safe, you can also bear the uncom being feeling uncomfortable. Absolutely. If it's not safe, you can't be with the discomfort. No, absolutely. And, and one of the key tasks of a regenerative teacher or, or someone trying to, 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 to do some type of regenerative education is precisely there in creating a culture and creating um, a community that feels comfortable in engaging with uncomfortableness together. Yeah. yeah. And th also there, it's you need to lead in the sense that 
um, if you can't bear the discomfort, you will never be able to take others yeah. um, to feel um, uncomfortable as well. Yeah, because it's not genuine. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. You need um, you need a certain degree of vulnerability, um, probably more than the students that are in your course yeah. and have the courage to be able to uh, to bring that into your education, even. Uh, or in my case, into my education, but also my work on the educational system, even when it's not appreciated um, or welcomed even uh, by the culture, the larger culture of the university or the school um, that you're part of. Yeah. Yeah, and it's even our human nature, how we are hardwired, is even to search for safety and comfort. So to expect from from other from the students kind of to um, to contain that themselves it's something that we need to learn absolutely and that's part that's that's part of the role of an educator um, to hold space for people to learn to be in that discomfort yeah to hold and space and yeah. to actively invite them into it yeah yeah absolutely yeah. definitely definitely great um just to as a, as a final question probably um because now we've spoken a lot about your own um mm -hmm. educational practice yeah. and you also have the uh, regenerative education podcast mm -hmm. and i was i was wondering like what is like a center of of gravity was like a shared view on that regenerative education and how to um change education like what we've just spoken mm. about like how you kind of set up a course in a completely different way um yeah and do you see yeah general practices in that in a so that it goes into a certain direction or is it do they all do their own thing or well I mean, it's part of the regenerative sort of paradigm to acknowledge uh, local biocultural diversity. What we did find uh, are a set of design practices that are practiced in very different ways or that are expressed in very different ways depending on the context, but that tend to be expressed by, any, by everyone. And we found seven, uh, seven of them. The first uh, and the major one was was putting a, a tackling an urgent and relevant transition challenge uh, at the core, and the second one was cultivating personal transformation. So those two elements or those two practices emerged basically across the different perspectives. Now again, the way that they were expressed is very different. Um, the balance between those two was also different, um, but. So yes, there are some fundamental, um, or there seems to be some fundamental practices, but the combinations through which they can be expressed are enormous, are based on the local context, are based on um, on the individuals involved, to the individual levels who are involved with, with practicing those practices. What I realized after three years or so of, of studying all of this with the podcast was also in other contexts is that when I started I was really when I started I was really focused on the external transition side I mean from the beginning there's always been an individual inner dimension part also relational so from the beginning there's always been also an, uh, an inner dimension but my focus has always been on connecting externally with the grand challenges, um, partially because of the urgency that we have to tackle them. And it sounds like common sense now, but it took me like three years of full-time research to discover this. Um, so I hope that others can feel, I can see that a lot faster. But the system, the, the educational system that we are now operating in doesn't really allow connecting for the amount of time and depth that's required to see transitions through if transitions ever really finish because then you're talking about decadal 
um, or at least multi-year developments. Now, that doesn't mean that it's impossible to create educational systems or design educational systems that would allow that. You know, maybe bachelor degrees spread over 10 years where people f mostly just focus on tackling a big challenge. We're not really sure why you would need a bachelor degree anyway, but anyway. What I've, what I've started to realize is that through these practices of, or through these different forms of regenerative education, we may not be able to change systems directly, but we may be able to plant the seeds of change, uh, both within the system, so by the interventions that we do with our students, researchers, communities, but also within the individuals that were temporarily entangled with, uh, or that, that were temporarily engaged with these forms of education. Now, I don't know for sure what they're going to do with those seeds, right? whether they're going to be nurtured, whether they're going to have enough water, nitrogen, etc., to grow and blossom. But I do know that I can work from that commitment of trying to plant and nurture as many of those seeds as I possibly can, with the intention that eventually some of them may blossom and create systemic change. Mm. <coughs> So um, it's it's you really put in words now as well on how like the challenge of balancing that personal development and um, systems change mm -hmm. within an existing system. Yeah. Um, and what I. I, to raise that question, and that's also a systemic question, why is a bachelor three years? If or we four talk in about, our case. But yeah. Sorry? Or four in or our four, case. Or four, yeah. But as, when we talk about um, lifelong learning and so on, and, um, and, and we're still in that paradigm, like, okay, I do high school and I go to, to, to a university of applied science or university and I get my bachelor and then mm -hmm. I go and do my master and then I'm prepared for what? Yeah. Um, well, it's extremely arbitrary. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's in, interesting to think that through. If we really want to follow transitions which take a long time, um, what does that mean for how we set up those um, courses or is it every time another group of students that kind of does part of the transition um, as as then the, the, the educators are like to um, follow it through yeah but then again you get that power dynamic that we spoke about before mm -hmm. because then there is like a, a, a starting point yeah where you first have to get the students to absolutely um, uh, before you can then move on yeah so Interesting questions, no answers. No. <laughs> Not yet. No. Well, um, answers, there are possible answers, but they require redesign of educational fundamentals. Yeah. Almost stuff that we hold sacred. Um, yeah. Which, I mean, I'm all for, but they're, they're definitely not the easiest. They're not as easy as creating a new course and hiding it from the exam board. That's not that difficult. No, yeah, and that also comes back to um, what we spoke about before. Like we're always in motion, but it goes very slow, and those kind yeah. of big changes are um, much more difficult to to really make. Yeah, Great. I need, need some patience. <laughs> yeah, I think this was a very nice insight in in like the whole conversation we had in regenerative education. Um, your view on that? Um, some practical examples on how you do that. Um, there's many more practical examples to find, be found in your podcast. Um, I will put the link in the show notes. Yeah. Thank and, you. Um, uh, is there anything that's remained unsaid that you still want to say? Well, I, I think doing this entire you know, research with the podcast and the other studies on the one end, it's been frustrating in the sense, like you, like the, the dichotomy you just highlighted as well, the slowness of some parts of the system. At the other hand, having been able to see so many innovative educators, you know, trying new stuff, doing new things, that's a tremendous source of hope. 
So mm. even though it may look sometimes that the educational systems aren't moving or they're moving very slowly, I think if we know where to look, uh, where to point our antennas, the signs of systemic change are already there. And, well, that fills me with hope. Great. That's a beautiful sentence, I think, to close this podcast, this um, episode with. Thank you, Boss, for having this conversation. And mm. I think it was very rich with a lot of information. And, um, yeah. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Great that you listened to this episode of the Embodiment Talks. Please let me know your thoughts about this episode or the insights that you gained. Email me to the address in the show notes. If you want to get in touch with me, or if you have a question or topic that you want to know more about, don't hesitate to send me an email as well. Do you want to be kept up to date? Like this podcast in your favorite podcast app. You can help me by giving a thumbs up or leaving a comment so that this podcast will reach more people. You can find more information about my work on my website www.embodimentlab.nl or my YouTube channel Embodiment Lab. Thanks for listening and meet you at the next episode. Thank you.